Okay, if you've had enough group theory, the second half of my talk is going to be rather less group theoretic and there'll be more emphasis on connections with topology and with Galois theory. So I'm going to start with a, talking about some topological invariants of Beauville surfaces. So one obvious thing to ask about, especially if you're working in St. Petersburg, is the Euler characteristic. And this Euler characteristic, um, it behaves in very nice ways. So for instance, ah. yeah, it's coming. Um, yeah, thanks. The Euler characteristic of a product is the product of the Euler characteristics. And if you factor out a group acting freely, you simply divide by the order of the group. So you can write down the Euler characteristic of a Beauville surface. You just take the product of the Euler characteristics of the two algebraic curves or Riemann surfaces and divide by the order of the group. So you, um, because a, a surface of genus G has Euler characteristic 2 minus 2G, then um, the product has this characteristic and you simply divide by the group order. So for instance in the case of the Fermat curves one can easily work out um, their um, Euler characteristic. So um, the examples I started with, all of those based on the Beauville surfaces, no matter which matrix A you take, they've all got the same Euler characteristic, n minus 3 squared over 2. So that's one obvious thing you might want to know about a Beauville surface, if you want to recognize it. And, um, and the other thing you might want to know is what is the fundamental group of the surface. And again, that's not so difficult to describe. Um, let's go back to the triangle groups. We've, um, G is a quotient of two triangle groups, delta 1 and delta 2. And these triangle groups, they're described up here. They're acting on the hyperbolic plane. And um, you have a surface group, Ki. It's the kernel of the epimorphism onto G. And um, if you take the product of the two triangle groups, this is acting on the product of two copies of the hyperbolic plane. And that's a simply connected space because the hyperbolic plane is simply connected. And you're quotienting out a group that's acting nicely, it's acting properly discontinuously. So there's no pathology in the way that this group acts. And um, by the Beauville construction, by the property here that um, the finite group is acting freely on the product, what that means is that um, um, this group K here this is the set of all elements in the product, the two triangle groups, which have the same quotient in G. So you have an epimorphism theta 1 from delta 1 onto G, an epimorphism from um, delta 2 into G. So if you like, think of this situation. You have theta 1 mapping the triangle group delta 1 onto G. You have delta 2. Um, mapped onto G by theta 2, like this. And then you have K1 embedded in here, K2 embedded in there. And what you're really doing here is taking a subgroup of um, delta 1, delta 2. It's the set of all elements that have the same image. So it's a sort of um, diagonal of um, delta 1 cross delta 2. So you have this um, K contained in delta 1 cross delta 2. And um, that group K acts freely on H cross H simply because we've insisted that G should act freely on the product. So K is acting freely, it's torsion free, it's acting freely on H cross H. So 
it is the fundamental group of the quotient space. So what this is telling you then is that pi 1, the fundamental group of S, has to be isomorphic to this group K. So um, you, you, you can think of um, a subgroup lattice here you have. Um, delta 1 cross delta 2. And then here you have the direct factors, say delta 1 and delta 2. And then here um, you have the trivial subgroup here. And um, K is a subgroup of finite index here. It's a subgroup of index. Um, the index is equal to the order of G. And, um, and this group K, you can think of it as having um, a, um, a normal subgroup. Um, it's got uh, pi 1 of x1. We have K1 cross K2 here, which you can think of as pi 1 of x1 plus pi, two, uh, pi 1 of x2. And then um, that is a normal subgroup of K. And the quotient is isomorphic to G. So here's K1. And um, the triangle groups appear as, as the quotients of K by K1. So that quotient there is isomorphic to um, delta 1 and, and this quotient here is isomorphic to delta 2. So you can think of um, the fundamental group K as, as being these two triangle groups fitted together. And um, the, the covering of S by x1 cross x2 corresponds to this product here being a normal subgroup of the fundamental group. Covering space theory tells you that um, coverings correspond to subgroups of the fundamental group. Regular coverings correspond to normal subgroups. So the regular covering of S by x1 cross x2 corresponds to the fact that k1 cross k2 is a normal subgroup with quotient group. G. So in terms of covering space theory, this is what's going on here. But it, what it means is that you've got a, a rather nice explicit description of the fundamental group here in terms of these two surface groups, K1 and K2. K1 and K2, they're, they're fundamental groups of compact Riemann surfaces, so they have um, very familiar um, presentations. Perhaps it would, would be useful to write down the presentation for a surface group, or does everyone know that? Mm -hmm. I believe that everyone knows that, but maybe... maybe well, maybe, maybe just in case I'll write down the... Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let me do it here. Um, so, let's say pi g, this is the fundamental group of a surface of genus g. Then it has um, two g generators, say a1, um, B1 up to AG, BG here. Yeah. And um, one defining relation, the product for my equals 1 up to G of the commutators of AI and BI is the identity. So here we've got two surface groups. We've got um, two surfaces of genus G1 and G2. So we've got two groups with K1 and K2 with presentations looking like that. And in principle, you could use all of this data to get a presentation for the fundamental group of S. You've got two finitely presented groups here fitted together using a finite amount of information. So in principle, one can work out a presentation for the fundamental group. In practice, it's unpleasant. But it can be done.
OK, so these are the two basic um, bits of information we've got about a Beauville surface. We've got the Euler characteristic and we've got the fundamental group. And um, Catanese, in one of the earliest papers on Beauville surfaces, he proved this rigidity result. It tells you, essentially, that that information almost completely determines the Beauville surface among complex surfaces. So if you have another complex surface with the same Euler characteristic and an isomorphic fundamental group, then it's diffeomorphic to the one, the, the Beauville surface that you have started with. So it, it, this is a, a typical rigidity result. It's telling you that a small amount of information determines a whole structure up to some isomorphism. In, in, in this case, it's diffeomorphism. Is it true only for Beauville surfaces or in general for... I, I don't know. I don't know how general the, this is. Beauville surfaces are very special and in particular there's some rigidity built in from the rigidity of triangle groups. You know, we know that among Fuchsian groups, for instance, only triangle groups are rigid. Um, in general, you can deform a, a Fuchsian group, um, change the shape of a fundamental region without changing the algebraic properties, but you cannot do that with triangle groups. If you change the shape of a triangle group, you change the algebraic properties, and they are the only Fuchsian groups that are, are rigid. In, in general, there's some tight Muller space within which you can make deformations. So I think a lot of these rigidity properties um, do use the rigidity of triangle groups in a very strong way. Three-dimensional case in real three-dimensional mm. case there is a most of rigidity. Most of rigidity applies. So, yes. Yes. But I know nothing about mm. Mm. complex two-dimensional surfaces. Mm. Yeah. In, in general, I think they're far from being being rigid. Yeah. Okay. So what this is telling you is that um, if you've got two Beauville surfaces with the same um, characteristic and fundamental group, then they are um, almost isomorphic to each other. All you can do is um, um, replace one or the other of them by its complex conjugate surface. If you just apply complex conjugation to the defining, um, to the coefficients of the defining polynomials, well, that's not going to change either the fundamental group or the Euler characteristic, but essentially that is all that you are allowed to do. Um, and the, well, this is the, essentially the remark I just made to Sasha down, down here. If, if you take algebraic curves of a fixed genus, as long as the genus is greater than zero, then you can deform the, the surface without changing the fundamental group or the Euler characteristic. Here you have the fundamental group here. It's the same for all surfaces of that genus. The characteristic is the same. It's always 2 minus 2g, but they are far from rigid because you have uncountably many Riemann surfaces of that fixed genus. So it's a very different situation in general. Um, now, one question that um, algebraic geometers are very interested in is whether a particular variety is real or not. And really, there are two ways you can ask this. You, you can ask if there's a biholomorphic map from the surface to its conjugate surface. That means a map that's holomorphic in, in both directions. If there is such a map, it needn't be of order two. There are examples where there is such a map but it has order greater than two. Um, so you can ask a slightly stronger condition, is there such a map sigma that is of order two? And um, that is the ideal situation. So algebraic geometers call these such varieties real. And um, one can convert that condition into purely group theoretic conditions, and that's what Bauer, Catanese, and Grunewald did. They had a rather complicated set of conditions, and I, what I'm going to do is look at a rather simpler situation than the most general situation. What you need to do is look at the in, what's called the inverse of a Beauville structure. A Beauville structure is a pair of triples, 
X1, XI, YI and ZI, satisfying the various conditions up there. And when you take complex conjugates, in terms of the triples, what you're doing is inverting two of them. You can't invert all three of them, because if you try that, then unless the group is abelian, the um, condition here that the product should be one is destroyed. You can only invert two of them, then you have to replace the third one by a conjugate of the inverse in order to make the product one. But, it, but um, you can do this, and this corresponds to reflecting or taking a complex conjugate. So you define the inverse of a triple or a structure to be obtained by inverting two of the th three elements in the triple, and they chose the x and the z. It doesn't really matter which you invert, as long as you invert two of them. If you can invert any two, you can invert all the other pairs. And then they introduced a group of transformations of Beauville structures, which includes this inversion. It includes the automorphisms coming from G. And what they showed was that um, um, these two conditions up at the top um, are satisfied if and only if the Beauville structure is either sent to its inverse, that's equivalent to condition one, or transposed with its inverse by some element of this group. So they've got this rather complicated group of transformations. You apply it to the Beauville structure and it answers questions one and two. Is the Beauville structure either in trans sent to its inverse or transposed with its inverse? Now, rather than looking at the whole group here, I, um, AU here, I've decided to concentrate on a special case where you only need to look at certain transformations. So, uh, as I said at, at the top, the whole definition is rather complicated. So, um, So the conditions are in the um, third line up there. What I want is to avoid um, automorphisms of the curves that um, permute the triples. So I want Li, Mi and Ni to be distinct for each i. So that means that you can't have um, automorphisms of the curve that permute these three branch points here. That's not a very strong restriction, so it cuts out the Fermat curves when the three were equal to each other. And then secondly, I want the first triple in some order to be distinct from the second triple in some order, and that prevents you from transposing the two curves. Distinct like sets. Yes. As sets, yes, yes. So uh, again, the Fermat curves fail that condition. The triples are n, n, n in both cases, but in most cases, the the triples here are the, the two triples of orders are distinct from each other, so there's no possibility of transposing the two curves. And if you make those rather weak um, restrictions, then the criterion of Beauville, Catanese, and Grunewald becomes much simpler. Um, you don't have to worry about these extra automorphisms appearing. And then, so, so the condition then is that. Um, um, the surface is real. This is what we want to know, whether it's real or not. Or, um, it turns out that it's real if and only if there's a biholomorphic map. If there is one, then it, you can invert it. And the group theoretic condition, this is the one that you can actually check using just group theory, is um, whether there are automorphisms alpha 1 and alpha 2 of G. You need two automorphisms of G, one inverting each triple, um, and you want them to differ by an inner automorphism of G. And that's the sort of condition you can check in many cases, either by hand or, or by computer, if the group is, is too large. So this gives you um, criterion for real Beauville surfaces, and that's exactly the sort of question that algebraic geometers are interested in. And um, so here's an example of a real Beauville structure. It's the one I used earlier for the um, symmetric groups. Um, 
the type um, was um, I started with a standard generating triple. I had an N cycle and then a transposition and the prod uh, maybe that's a typo, that should be N minus one I think there. Doesn't matter. It, it satisfies the criterion. And then the second um, structure, I had a cycle of length C and a, a cycle of length N minus C and then a product of three transpositions, so it had order two and the product was n minus one. Anyway, it, it does satisfy the condition that I had early, um, just a minute or two ago. The two triples are distinct and there are no repeated periods among them. So, um, so we can use that um, conditioner I showed you a minute or two ago. And what we're looking for then, let me just go back to it, we're, We've got two triples now, and we're asking, is, are there two automorphisms, alpha 1, alpha 2, or G, inverting these two triples and differing just by an inner automorphism? OK, so that's what we need to do. Um, well, um, if I show you the pictures, it's much easier to believe that such automorphisms exist because that's the picture I showed you um, a few minutes ago. But I put in a line of symmetry for the first one as an obvious reflection of the first picture. And what that does is it inverts um, the first generator, x1, and it inverts z1, which you think of as being as corresponding to the faces of this map. And then the in the second picture, again, there's a red line of symmetry here, and if you reflect in that horizontal line, um, you've got a symmetry of that design, and um, what it's doing is inverting the generator X2, which is the rotation around the white vertices, and it's inverting Z2, which corresponds to the faces of that um, design. So you've got a pair of symmetries there, and these are elements of the symmetric group, transposing 1 and 2, um, 3 and n, 4 and n minus 1, and so on, inverting the first triple. And likewise here, there's an element of the symmetric group, transposing 2 and c, 3 and c minus 1, and so on, inverting that triple. So that's a pair of inner automorphisms, um, which is inverting that triple. So that particular Beauville surface has to be real. By the, condi by the theorem we had a few minutes ago, that Beauville surface is real. But you, you can change the example slightly. I use exactly the same triple in the first case. And in the second case, um, y2 was a product of three transpositions, and I simply change the transposition slightly. So here's the picture now. And all I, all I did there was switch this loop and this edge here. If you go back to um, there, that's the previous <coughs> picture, which is symmetric, and I've just made a little change, switching that loop with that edge there. So it now looks like that. Exactly the same argument as bef I used before tells you that this is a Beauville structure. Um, so you get a Beauville surface out of this. You've still got the symmetry in the vertical axis here, so you can invert this triple, but we've lost the symmetry here. It's easy to believe that there is no um, automorphism of a symmetric group that inverts that triple. There are no outer automorphisms for the symmetric group. It's a complete group. All its automorphisms are inner, as long as n is not 6, and n is bigger than 6 in this example. So um, all you have to do is look for conjugation within the symmetric group, and there is no element of the symmetric group that conjugates this triple to its inverse. So that's a non-real Beauville structure. Okay, the, the other thing that um, people are interested in is the action of the absolute Galois group. This is the Galois group of the field of or algebraic numbers. Now, 
we started off with a couple of regular Desang, um, and um, yeah, we have regular design here, and as we all know by Bielli's theorem, um, any um, Riemann surface that carries a design um, is defined as an algebraic curve over the field of algebraic numbers. The complex structure obtained from a design is defined over the algebraic numbers, and therefore the Galois group of the algebraic numbers, this very large, very mysterious, and very important absolute Galois group um, acts on, well, it, it, first of all, it acts on the design, and it acts on the group that we're using, and therefore it has an induced action on Beauville surfaces, just allow it to act on all, all of the coefficients that define the design and, and the group. What does it mean, G sigma? It is the action of well, you, you can represent the group G, and um, G is acting on these um, x1 and 2, these are algebraic curves, so it, it's acting on the um, coordinates as rational functions, so there's, there's an induced action of the absolute Galois group on the, on the group G. Yeah. And you can check uh, very easily that all, all the Beauville conditions up, I've listed up here are invariant under the absolute Galois group. So um, if you apply any element of the absolute Galois group to a Beauville surface, you get another Beauville surface. And you only need a finite amount of data to specify um, a Beauville surface S, it's defined by two algebraic curves and a finite group acting on them, so um, its orbit under the absolute Galois <coughs> group has to be finite. All, all the coefficients that um, define S are algebraic numbers, so they lie in finite orbits under the absolute Galois group. So although this absolute Galois group, it's a huge group, it's an uncountable group, but um, all its orbits are finite, and um, it's been a conjecture for a long time, um, and recently it was proved by Gabino Gonzalez Diaz and Andre Jaikin Zaparain in, in Madrid um, that the action on regular design is faithful. We've known um, for 30 years or so that the action of the absolute Galois group on design in general is faithful even if you restrict to a particular genus, it's still faithful, but um, it's much harder to prove that the action on regular design is faithful. Actually, the, the essential tool to do this, it's a theorem of Jardin on um, profinite groups, and that was actually proved in the 1980s, round about the time that Grote and Deke wrote his notes on design. So it could have been proved almost round about the time of Gerton de excess but, um, The same hyperbolic type, hyperbolic type is the triple LMN. A triple LMN, yes. If you fix a hyperbolic, a, a triple LMN satisfying the, um, the inequality which we have um, here, okay, as long as you exclude the sphere and the torus, in other words, um, if you look at all the regular design of that particular type, you may think that that's a rather small class, but it's rich enough that this uncountable group, this absolute Galois group, acts faithfully. So if you just restrict the Hurwitz curves, for instance, 2, 3, 7, triple, you have a faithful action. And I think to prove it, you needed a combination of someone like um, Gabino Gonzalez Diaz here, who's a, an expert on Teichmuller theory, discrete groups, co-author of a book on design, but also Andre Jaikin's apparain, who is an expert in profinite groups. And this absolute Galois group, it's a profinite group. It's a projective limit of finite groups. And in the last decade or two, a lot of um, progress has been made in understanding profinite groups. And he comes from that community, and he had just the right techniques, the, the right ability to apply 
um, results but pro-finite groups to prove that this action is faithful. But uh, as I said, the essential tool was proved about 30 years ago. And I think no one saw that it was needed in order to, or had the ability to apply it in this particular context. So anyway, we've got the action of this absolute Galois group. There are many examples, and Sasha here is a leading expert here, on how the absolute Galois group acts on design. But now we have higher dimensional structures on, w on which it can also act. And algebraic geometers are in interested to know when two curves, or bovo um, sorry, when two surfaces, when two bovial surfaces are equivalent under the Galois group, or if you start with one Beauville surface, what is its orbit? Okay, well, in, um, in the case of Desain, um, the absolute Galois group cannot change the topology. It can change the combinatorics, and it can change the complex structure of a design, but it cannot change the topology. And the reason is that the, the genus is invariant. You can define the genus in a purely algebraic way, using the riemann roch theorem, for instance. And it, you define it in such a way that the absolute Galois group must preserve it. So all the surfaces in a given orbit of the absolute Galois group, they have the same genus, and therefore they are topologically equivalent. They are homeomorphic to each other. So the topology does not change. If you like, a topologist cannot see the absolute Galois group acting if he just looks at surfaces, Riemann surfaces. But in higher dimensions, it's different. And there are examples going right back to a little paper of Serre. It's only about two or three pages in 1964. And, and what he gave was a pair of complex surfaces. They defined like these Beauville surfaces over the algebraic numbers. They're conjugate under the absolute Galois group, but, but they're not homeomorphic. In fact, they have non-isomorphic fundamental groups, so they certainly cannot be homeomorphic. And then using these examples, you can get examples in higher dimensions. It's easy to go from dimension two to higher dimensional examples. And since then, a number of similar constructions have been found for pairs of varieties with this property. And then, um, Gabino, Gonzalez Diaz, and David Torres, Tiger. Oh, he'll be angry, I've misspelled his name there. It should be T E I. He's one of these Spaniards who calls himself David Torres, but in writing he says that his mother will be extremely angry with him if, if, if the maternal name as well as the paternal name is not included. So in all publications he's David Torres Tigel. He says he, he won't be allowed to go home with his laundry if he doesn't include his mother's name in his publications. Anyway, what they did was they used Beauville surfaces to construct examples like this, but not just pairs, but orbits of unbounded finite size. The orbits, as I said, have to be of finite size, but they can be arbitrarily large. And I'll just illustrate how, how their construction works. So this is one of the things which is much easier to do using group theory, very difficult to do using pure algebraic geometry. Um, so w what you first need is a condition for two Beauville surfaces to be isomorphic to each other, and this is one of the first results that Catanese proved. If you have two Beauville surfaces, S is constructed as up there, S prime is constructed in exactly the same way, but maybe using a different pair of um, curves and a different group. But if they have the same fundamental group, this is all you need to assume, then almost everything is uniquely determined. The two groups are isomorphic, and the factors, well, they may be transposed. You can always switch x1 and x2, and you can always apply complex conjugation, but that's all. So the two factors, up to, uh, up to renumbering and applying complex conjugation, they are uniquely determined by the fundamental group. So again, it's one of these rigidity results that tells you that a minimum amount of information determines almost everything. And in particular, if you've got two homeomorphic Beauville surfaces, then 
they certainly have isomorphic fundamental groups, so all these conclusions hold. The groups are isomorphic, and the factors are almost isomorphic to each other. What we actually need here is the converse. We want Beauville surfaces, a lot of them, that are not homeomorphic to each other. What we want is a large Galois orbit of mutually non-homeomorphic surfaces. And um, if you can arrange that the factors are not um, isomorphic to each other or um, complex conjugates, then the fundamental groups have to be non-isomorphic by this result, and therefore the spaces cannot be homeomorphic. So this result of catenase, this rigidity result, is the essential tool. Um, there are several proofs of it around. Catanese's original proof uses um, some quite sophisticated algebraic geometry. Um, I think the problem was that Gabino and David didn't really understand the proof, so they reproved it using their own tools, namely uniformization theory and discrete group theory. But anyway, it's available to be used. And this is the construction. So. Um, this is going back to work of Macbeth um, from Birmingham in the 1960s. Um, he proved that various um, finite simple groups, the PSL2P groups, um, are Hurwitz groups. They're images of the 237 triangle group, which means that they attain the upper bound for the number of automorphisms of a Riemann surface. And then his result was generalized by Manfred Streit in Frankfurt in, the, in 2000. And what he showed was that um, if you take an integer at least seven, Macbeth took seven, but you can take any integer at least seven. And as long as the prime P satisfies this congruence, congruent to plus or minus one mod two N, then this particular group here has um, a lot of generating triples of type 2, 3, n. Um, this condition here guarantees that the group has elements of order n, and um, you can count them, and this is the number of conjugacy classes of such elements in the group. And what happens is that you can have one, two, one triple of type 2, 3, n from each of the different conjugacy classes and up to automorphisms, those are distinct from each other. These triples correspond to regular design or quasi-platonic curves and these, these are all defined over this particular algebraic number field. You take the field of the nth roots of unity, the cyclotomic field of the nth roots of unity Take the real subfield, so this is a subfield of in index 2 in that, and they're defined over this field, and they, um, this is a field of um, an extension of the rationals of degree phi of n over 2, and they form a single orbit of the absolute Galois group. So this is one of the few cases where we've got very explicit information about um, an orbit of the absolute Galois group on, on regular design. So, you take the first factor to be one of these curves, and already it's in a large orbit. If you take n to be large enough, phi of n will be large, so you've got a large orbit of the Galois group here. It's also, um, these are also real curves, be essentially because this is a subfield of the reals. So, these um, these curves are isomorphic to their images. We need a, we need a second generating triple, and um, it has to satisfy this condition down here. Now, the, the elements of sigma 1, they all have order 2, 3, or p. The triple had type 2, 3, p, where p was prime. So apart from the identity, the conjugates of the powers of the generators all have order 2, um, sorry, 2, 3, and n. 2, 3, and divisors of n. The triple had type 2, 3, n. So what you do is you try and find a generating triple 
of a completely different type, and you can do it with type PPP. Uh, I've just outlined how the calculation goes here. Um, I'm looking for a triple of elements of all of order P, this, um, within this group PSL2P, and think of it as SL2P, two by two matrices, modulo plus or minus one. So here's a typical element of order P. This matrix has order P, so it gives you an element of order P in the group. Um, another element of the same trace, this element has trace two, like this one, and that implies that this one also has order P. For any choice of A, B, and C, that will have order P. You compute Z2 just by working out the inverse of the product. It looks like this. And I want this also to have um, trace plus or minus 2. Well, the trace of this is the A's cancel. So it's 2 plus C. So you want either C to be 0 or C to be minus 4. If you take C equals 0, then both of these matrices have a zero in the bottom left corner, so they can't generate the whole group. They'll generate a proper subgroup. If you take C to be minus four, then um, it works. Um, you can check through. There's a list of maximal subgroups of G, and there's an old group theory book by Dixon from the 1920s. And what he does is he lists all the maximal subgroups of this particular group, PSL2P, and you can check that there is no maximal subgroup containing this generating triple. So it must generate the whole group. And as long as P is at least seven, it does so. So you've now constructed a generating triple of type PPP. X2, Y2, and Z2 all have order P, their product is one, and they generate the group. So you've got the second generating triple. And in fact, it's unique up to automorphisms. That's not hard to prove. So you've got this generating triple of type PPP. So you've got, you can just about see it here. You've got a curve X2. And because of this uniqueness, it's actually defined over the rationals. So we've now got our two generating triples. Uh, of, all, of, of types 2, 3n and PPP. So here they are now. We've got generating triples of types 2, 3n and PPP. And because P is co-prime to 2, 3, and n, there cannot be um, an element in sigma 2. The elements in sigma 2 will have order P, and they cannot be conjugate to elements of sigma 1. So, so th this disjointness condition down here is satisfied and therefore we've got um, a Beauville surface. Um, we constructed X1, or Manfred Streit did, in order um, that it should be in an orbit of the absolute Galois group of length phi n over 2. So its images under the absolute Galois group, um, they're equal to their complex conjugates but they're not isomorphic to each other. So we've got phi, uh, phi n over two non-isomorphic images of x1 appearing. These are not isomorphic to x2, they, they've got different genus. So this orbit um, of Beauville surfaces, it must contain at least phi n over two uh, non-homeomorphic Beauville surfaces. This is going back to the um, Catanese rigidity result that tells you that essentially if, if the curves Xi are not isomorphic then the Beauville surfaces are not homeomorphic to each other. So what you're getting is an orbit of at least phi n over 2 non-homeomorphic Beauville surfaces and you can make that as large as you like by suitably choosing n. The one unsatisfactory aspect of this result was that they couldn't give an exact value for the length of this orbit. They knew it was at least phi n over 2, but there are various technical problems coming from outer automorphisms of this group SL, PSL2P. It's got outer automorphisms and they 
they can interfere with the Beauville surfaces in a rather unpleasant way. But if you replace it with this group, PGL2P, so all you're doing here is going from matrices of determinant 1, that's what the S here means, the special linear group here, to the general linear group, arbitrary invertible matrices over the field of P elements. This group has no outer automorphisms, and that avoids these technical problems. Essentially, the same method works with a few extra ingredients, but essentially the same method works, and you get exactly phi n over 2 rather than at least phi n over 2. And you can also get um, continuous families of surfaces, um, not not all Beauville surfaces, there are only countably many Beauville surfaces, but you can have continuous families with um, M parameters containing these Beauville surfaces, um, these non-homeomorphic um, varieties. So what this is showing is that unlike in the case of Dazin, where the absolute Galois group um, acts trivially on the um, topology, here you can um, make it act in very non-trivial ways on, on the topology. It can change the topology of these Beauville surfaces. There's a little bit more I want to say, but not much. But are there any questions about that particular construction? I don't understand the last part, and parameter families. Um, I don't but claim to entirely understand it. I'm one of the three authors of a paper on it, but the, that bit was written by Gabino and David. What you, uh, what you have uh, is... These are complex. Uh, these are complex surfaces, yes. and um, uh, these... Um, you have a whole family. Um, if you like, this is all happening in Teichmuller space. And you have a family of complex surfaces in Teichmuller space, and you have M complex parameters. Um, and there are, there are points on this, uh, this surface. There are points on this There are points, on there, are points on this, uh, there are points which correspond to Beauville surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, there are only countably many Beauville surfaces, because they are defined by pairs of design. And, um, so, um, but the these M parameter families, they, they contain um, these arbitrarily large Galois or orbits. So they can reconstruct the, uh, the groups? You can think of them as deformations of mm -hmm. these. Um, but I mean mm -hmm. fundamental groups, uh, some, some changes. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand entirely how the fundamental group changes as you move around the parameters, but uh, move around the families. But certainly the Beauville surfaces in there have um, distinct fundamental groups. Yeah. This is one of the areas where my algebraic geometry is not adequate to understand what is going on. Okay, well, well, there's one other phenomenon um, here that, um, again, this was something po pointed out by Sayer in, in the same paper in, in 1964. Um, in addition to the fundamental group of a variety, which is topologically defined, there's another related um, structure called the algebraic fundamental group. And what this is, is the it's the profinite completion of the fundamental group. Y if you take any discrete group, or in indeed any group, you can define its profinite completion. And this is the inverse limit of all of its finite quotients. Perhaps I should explain what I mean by, by that, yeah. Um, So let's take, um, um, let's call it pi. It's in, the, in the typical case, it's going to be the fundamental group, pi 1 of a Beauville surface. But in general, let's take this to be any group. Infinite to make it interesting. Um, 
then let's take all um, all n all normal subgroups of pi a finite index. So in other words, um, you have a finite quotient. Now, if you have two of these, if, let's say, n1 is contained in n2, two of these normal subgroups of finite index, then um, there's an epimorphism. Say from um, right, theta 1, 2, from pi over n1 to pi over n2. Just a natural epimorphism. So what you now have is a, a family of finite groups here, possibly with repetitions, because some of these quotients could be isomorphic to each other. You have a family of finite groups and you have a family of epimorphisms between them. And what you do is you take um, pi hat, this is called a profinite completion, it's the inverse limit of this family of groups and epimorphisms. Now what do I mean by that? Well, there's a very explicit construction of this. Um, what you can do is you can take the Cartesian product over, say, all, all such n of these, um, yeah, normal so, uh, of all these finite quotient groups, and um, you take the set of all G. Uh, let me write it as. Um, The set of all G equals GI in this in this product. So think of these as vectors now, with inf infinitely many coordinates, one in each finite component, and you take all the vectors here whose coordinates are compatible with these epimorphisms. So the restriction is that theta one, uh, well, let's say theta i j of um, GI should be gj, or whatever, say ni is contained in nj. So whenever you've got an inclusion between two of these normal subgroups of finite index, you want the resulting epimorphism here to um, be compatible with the coordinates of the, of the vector. So you take all elements in the Cartesian product whose coordinates gi and gj um, fit together under these epimorphisms. In general, this is an uncountable group. Even if you start, start with a countable infinite group, G, you are, you are going to get an uncountable group out of this. It's a profinite group. It's a projected limit of finite groups. So it's a profinite group, just like the absolute Galois group is. Um, you can construct the absolute Galois group in a similar way as the inverse limit of all the finite Galois groups of the finite normal extensions of the reals, or of the rationals, rather. Um, so the idea is that this profinite completion, this pi hat, which it contains pi as a subgroup, but it, it also, in a sense, wraps up into a single structure all the finite homomorphic images, all the finite epimorphic images of this group pi. And if you apply it where pi here is little pi 1 of S, the fundamental group of S, what you get is what's called the profinite completion. And this is the algebraic fundamental group. And this construction is often used um, in areas like algebraic geometry, algebraic topology, and so on. It's a, in many ways, a more useful object than the fundamental group itself, because what it includes is all the normal subgroups of finite index, and these correspond to the regular coverings of, in this case, the surface S. Covering space theory tells you that coverings correspond to 
conjugacy classes of subgroups of the fundamental group. Regular coverings correspond to normal subgroups, and um, finite coverings correspond to subgroups of finite index. So it makes a lot of sense to use this construction as a way of studying all the finite regular coverings of a particular topological space. And here we're doing it for the Beauville surface. What Sayer noticed, and it's a rather strange phenomenon, is that um, in these examples which you've just been studying, um, the, t the fundamental groups are distinct. They're not isomorphic to each other. That was part of the construction. We, we constructed the Galois orbit so that um, they had non-isomorphic fundamental groups, pi 1 of s. But their algebraic fundamental groups are isomorphic to each other. And the reason is that, um, well it's explained down here, the, these normal subgroups N and the inclusions and quotient groups, they all correspond to the finite regular coverings of S and these are all algebraically defined. You can define all of this data here using algebraic numbers in such a way that um, that data is preserved by the absolute Galois group. So all of these coverings they're quite, um, all, all of these um, normal subgroups of finite index, all these quotients, all the coverings between them are invariant under the Alwa, uh, absolute Galois group and therefore these algebraic fundamental groups are invariant under the algebraic group, um, absolute Galois group. So the point is that they are defined in a much more algebraic way than the fundamental group itself which is defined purely topologically and well as you know if you study any non-trivial action of the absolute Galois group on Dizan it behaves topologically in a very bad way apart from complex conjugation and the identity all of its elements act in a very non-continuous way so um, so topology can be quite badly destroyed by the absolute Galois group but these and at more algebraic constructions like this profinite completion here are invariant. Well, Sayer pointed out that this happened for the pairs of varieties that he, he constructed, but for exactly the same reason it, um, it happens in these large orbits that um, can be constructed using Beauville surfaces. And I think that's a good place to stop because I'm running out of voice, so I'll say Diochen Vauri He, and if you don't speak Welsh, don't blame me if you don't, and that's what it means. So, thank you very much for listening. That's Welsh? That's Welsh, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Is it uh, in general uh, um, no. A map from which, um, from from, which group? From P1 to algebraic P1. Um, no, no. Um, um, you see, um, this is an uncountable yes. group. Uh, uh, ah, yes. So, um, so you, can, you can embed um, pi in, um, in this just as the diagonal. Subgroup. There's a natural embedding in this, um, but um, even in very simple cases, if you even if you start with the integers, for instance, the profinite completion of the integers is already um, quite a complicated, um, uncountable group. So um, you should really think of pi here as being a very small subgroup. Of this. It's embedded, yes. It, okay. there's, there's a natural embedding of pi in, in pi hat, yes. Yeah. Mm. If you like, this is a um, completion with respect to a certain topology. That's one, one way of thinking on it. Is it the mm. usual situation that uh, different groups have the same finite condition? 
Well, I wasn't aware of that until I came across this example. Uh, I've shown this to some of the people who work on profinite groups from a purely group theoretic point of view, and they were quite surprised by this example. But it's quite natural from a more geometric mm -hmm. point of view. So whether it's a common occurrence or whether it's rare, I'm really not sure. But um, it's certainly a, a rather strange phenomenon, to me at least. I was quite surprised when I first realized that it was happening. But I don't know how, how common it is. Oh, well, um, the, the, the quotients of the integers are quite easy to describe. They're just the finite cyclic groups. So what you have is the family of all finite cyclic groups. Each appears only once because there's only one normal subgroup of each finite index. So you, you take the collection of all, let's say, Zn, where n is any natural number, and then you have, say, theta, well, let's say, theta m n from Zm to Zn, um, if and only if, say, um, um, n divides m. Okay, those are the epimorphisms yeah. be between them. And then what you now do is you take um, You have a family of um, um, epimorphisms like this. So whenever n divides n, you have this epimorphism theta m m n. And here you have the cyclic group of order one, like that. So everything maps onto that, and you have a, a sort of tree. Uh, uh, but ah, oh, the, the point is, if you take an element here, let's take an element, uh, let's say G in, in Zn, this has two, um, well, well the, the number of inverse images here is equal to M over N. So you, if you trace backwards from G, if you work back to the left from G, at each stage you have at least two routes you can take. So the, and what you have to do is look at all the paths you can have working backwards, and that's uncountable. Because at every stage you have at least two directions in which you can go. So the number of um, paths, or if you like, the number of ends of the graph is uncountable. Even if you took the inverse limit of all the groups of order a power of two, if you had Z1, Z2, Z4, Z8, and so on here, even in that case, you've always got two choices every time you move to the left. So you have uncountably many possible elements. So the number of vectors you can have which um, satisfy the condition, um, <laughs> the number of these infinite vectors you can have satisfying this compatibility condition is always uncountable. As long as you have um, infinitely many normal subgroups of finite index. Of course, th this becomes trivial. If you, apply, if you apply this to a simple group, for instance, you have only, um, well, you will have no finite images apart from the identity, so you'll get nothing of interest. What you really need is a residually finite group, one that has a lot of normal subgroups of finite index. And then you're going to get an uncountable group out of it. It's very curious that this construction is used in probabilistic number theory. There is a <coughs> finitely countable measure on Z, on Z mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, divisible by, uh, by P is 1 over P, to be, yes. if P yeah. is prime, to be divisi divisible yes. by Q is 1 over Q. Yes. And these uh, uh, events are <coughs> independent, independent mm. yes. but the measure is, is not countably, countably additive. Okay. And it yes. becomes countably additive on this space. Okay. So you can yeah. just use the, the usual probabilistic okay. constructions. 
mm. <coughs> which you cannot use uh, over okay. the Okay. Yeah, th th this is a problem ab about assigning probabilities to random number theoretic events. It's very difficult to define the appropriate probability yes, measure. And, and on this it, space, it is yeah. much easier. If you do it, then all sorts of number theoretic phenomena, like Euler products and so on, become very easily understandable as statements about probabilities. Um, things like, well, you get formulae with things like 1 minus 1 over p appearing in them. You have products. In fact, I wrote one down, like 1 minus 2 over p, and I had two more factors like that. And of course, these are very s simple probabilities. This is the probability that a random integer is co-prime to p. This is the probability of two integers co-prime to p, and, and so on. And you have Euler products with factors like that appearing in them. And you can understand these Euler products much easier if you think them, about them as probabilities. But making that precise yes, is difficult it is, it is because difficult. it's not obvious what yes. the probability measure yes, is. You, can, you cannot apply just general theorems of probability. Exactly. Yeah. And when you get, go to finite completion, you can mm. apply them. <coughs> yeah. Yes, that's no, yeah, that's a nice observation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Go ahead. No more questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.